in our lives when we're getting closer to God is this, when we see him as king. If we see him as king, that means we're servants, right? That means we're going to be obedient, and it's the master-slave relationship. It's the king and the servant relationship. And when that begins to happen and take place in our lives, that's when change takes place. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. I'm back there with you. Sometimes I say that. My wife tells me I need to quit saying that. Hush! We hear you. Okay. So things go on take place in our lives. It all depends on who we see Jesus as. He's not just a buddy, a pal, a friend. Uh, He's not just a helper, and he is all those things. But oftentimes, we become too comfortable with that. And we forget him as being king of our lives. And when he quits being king of Buddy's life, that's when life falls apart. That's when, when... my wife gets mad at me because of some of the things I do. That's when my children, you know, ain't acting the way they are supposed to act because daddy's not acting the way he's supposed to act. When I miss, when I forget that Jesus is more than just a friend, a pal, and a buddy, this is what tends to happen. We will slip into letting a little bit of sin creep into our lives and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And pretty soon... Well, God, he knows my heart. (laughs) That scares me when it comes to that. He does know my heart. He knows my attitudes. He knows my thoughts. He knows everything about me. And when he becomes my friend, my pal, and my buddy, we take that to mean it's okay if I do what I want to do and believe what I want to believe and do this, tell Jesus what he needs to do instead of me following. Life has a tendency to lead that way but we get when I get a proper understanding that Jesus is king and he's king now he's king in my life and I need to obey him I need to serve him I need to honor him with a heart of worship then things in life gets better better from the perspective of my relationship with him and the things that he strengthens me to do the sin that he helps me to overcome in my life. And we're here in the book of Matthew in, in chapter 17. We're going to look at the first nine verses. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is king. The majesty or the glory and the majesty of Jesus. When we see that, all glory and all majesty of Jesus, that, Jesus, that comes with him being king, doesn't it? That comes with him as being son of the living God. Here, now, and forever. King of my life and king of your lives. When we see his kingship over our lives. We're more ready to follow and obey. We have a few good suggestions that are worthless and we have a tendency to give it to him anyway. And we're going to see some of that. But he always has that quick, that swift, that loving correction and rebuke that comes in our lives. And directs us on the right path. So if you're there with me. If you please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 17 verse 1. Six days later Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother. And led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. And his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground and were terrified and Jesus came to them and he touched them and he said get up and do not be afraid and lifting up their eyes they saw no one except Jesus himself alone as they were coming down from the mountain Jesus commanded them saying tell no one tell the vision to no one until the son of man has risen from the dead let's pray father thank you for this day and this hour. 
Lord Jesus, bless your word. We ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I, uh, as I get to talk with, with people, they will, you know, we'll tell them, you know, go to Walkerville, and, and they say, yeah, well, how are things going out there? I'll say the things going is, is great. It's wonderful. I think I told the youth this. But I, I said, you know, the, the marks of a healthy church is not just a filled-up church house, is it? It's not just having to use the overflow room. What, what the, some of the benchmarks of a healthy church is this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a life that is being conformed to his image. That's how we know things are happening at Walkerville Baptist Church. That's how we know God is here because I am dealing with sin. And you are dealing with sin in your lives. We can fill it up for everything, can't we? We can get a house full of people, but when people are getting here because God is changing their lives, we know he's at work. We know he's doing something. That's the mark of a healthy church. That's the mark of a Christ-centered church. And it goes back to what we believe about Christ. Pastor Greg's been bringing it pretty hard here lately, ain't it? If I'm not mistaken, some of the ladies' Bible studies have been just as hard as Pastor Greg's preaching, hasn't it? The, you know, things are coming together. God is just building things. He's bringing things together with him as the focus, with him as the center port, and he's drawing us together. We are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ for we are seeing him for who he is. Right here in Matthew chapter 17, one of the greatest things that will ever get our attention is this, the second coming of Christ. That's what this chapter is about. It's showing Jesus one day he's going to come back in his glory. He's just giving us a short glimpse right now of what that glory is like here on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's letting us know when he comes back, he's coming back in power and glory, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's showing these three disciples this, what they're going to look like, what's going to be seen. Are y'all ready for the second coming? Amen. Yes. Because seven years before then, we're out of here. And we're with him. We're looking forward to that day. He came back first just as a man, just, just like we are in human form. But when he comes back, he's coming back as king with all the glory and all the majesty of heaven, with all the glory and all the majesty of the Father in heaven, of his Father who sent him the first time to die. This is Good stuff in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew, as he's teaching through his, through his gospel, giving that gospel account, he presents Jesus as king. That's why he moves kind of fast through all these things and not much detail. But Jesus tell, shows us this, or Matthew shows us this through, through his gospel. They're short clips of, of everything that Jesus does. This is what he does. He heals a man, and then he goes over here, and he's teaching, and then he, he, he heals a person, and, and he's back in two. He moves real fast. But we know this, Jesus is king when we get through with Matthew. One point to uh, remember. Now this is Jesus showing them a glimpse of his coming. Look at verse 28 of chapter 16. It says, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here with you who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So he, he kind of moves into the Mount of Transfiguration there. They moved from Caesarea Philippi about 25 miles, I think, up to Mount Hermon. Maybe it took them about six days to get there or so. For it says, uh, uh, first part of chapter 17, in six days. Six days later, they get up in the mountain. So they've left Caesarea Philippi and they've gone up in this mountain. And now some of them, they are fixing to see Jesus Christ in majesty and glory in his kingship. A picture, a short glimpse of what it's going to be like when he comes back to rule and reign. One thing we need to know, no matter what happens, Jesus is still king. No matter what happens, Jesus is still king. Jesus had taught him a couple times coming up to this point right here. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem, boys. And what they're going to do to me there, the, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they're going to take me, they're going to kill me, and, and they're going to put me on a cross, and I'm going to die. He says, but I'm going to be raised back again. See, that don't set good with some folks. That didn't set good with Peter. Sometimes Jesus' way is not our way, is it? 
But no matter what the end looks like, if it's his way, he's the king. We need to follow it. We need to go with it. We don't need to divert. Does that make sense? I did it again. I don't apologize, though. But does it make sense? If it's his way, I've got to follow. I have. And I see his way when I read the word. Because it's truth. It's right. And we follow it. But no matter what happens, he's still king. Now for those three disciples to have just heard their master was going to be killed, was going to be placed in a grave. That may not have sat too well with them. They may not have liked that. But they didn't like that. So Jesus has taken them three up here on this mountain. Well, let me give you a little bit of glimpse of what's going to happen. I've got to walk this path first, but when I come out the other side, this is what it's going to be like. This is who, who we're going to be. So he takes them up on this high mountain. And look at verse 2. Jesus was changed right there before their eyes. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. And his garments became as white as light. I don't know how to explain that. There's light coming in that wind, and I can look at the sun during the day, you know, and it's hot, and it's bright, and then you look away, and you can't see anything. And, and Jesus, this is, this is a, a white light that's nothing like the sun's light. This is a brilliant, bright, gleaming light. This is who he is. He is transfigured. He is transformed in front of him. He is changed it's to the glory of heaven, which is going to outshine the sun. It's going to be a different light than anything this earth has to offer. And they got to see it. It's like that. that probably some of you did, hunting. It's like that two million candle power cubane. Light up a mile away. You know what I'm saying? This is Jesus, all right? There ain't no guns and deer involved either. This is Jesus when he presents himself coming back in glory, the majesty of heaven. He is transformed. He is transfigured. Look, look at this. In, he was transfigured. Well, what does that mean? What's transfigured mean? What's, what's transformed mean? It doesn't mean take a few body parts and rearrange them. It's not like the, the bumblebee on TV, the transformer car, you know, he's car one minute and the transformer the next robot. No, that is not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is a meta, metamorphosis that takes place. It's a change that doesn't happen from the outside but from the inside. What Jesus has done, he's peeled back the flesh and he's let the pure glory of heaven shine out and the majesty of the kingdom of God shine for everybody to see. It's a metamorphosis that takes place inside. That's what's coming out of Jesus. That's why it's not of this world. It's of God. It's a light. It's so bright, so brilliant. Uh, the commentators call it it's the Shekinah glory of God that just comes out. It just opens up. It says his, his clothes are even white and shining. And, and uh, listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about it. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact, the exact imprint of his nature. The radiance. So he's got this glory, this Shekinah glory radiating out from him. It begins in Jesus and then it goes out. It begins in him and his face just shines. His body can't contain it anymore. He opens up himself and shows his Glory. The glory. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? To have the glory of God shine through. Listen, listen to what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed, are being changed from the inside out. What do you mean? When we are followers of Christ, we should be being changed. That that same glory shine through us. That's just a side note. That's not part of this. We're talking about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ is coming. Him as Son of God. Him as King of glory. The one I need to obey and the one that I need to follow. The one that I want to become like. This is who He is. And He shows them He is the King. Light just explodes through Him. That's a great thing to know, isn't it? Because there's sometimes... In 
dealing and struggling with my life and with, with your lives, and I know we go through hard times and struggles. Sometimes I wonder, Lord, you still king? Are you still got things under control? Because it doesn't look like it to me. Then he's going to reconfirm and says, yes, I am. He is the king. He's always going to be king. He's coming back today. And when those times happen, we get into his word, we'll see this. Another thing we need to remember is that all through the Old Testament testifies to him. It testifies to him. As we see this, Right there as he's transfigured and Peter and those three apostles, they are looking at him. They're seeing him. And uh, look at verse 4. Excuse me, verse 3. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. You know, sometimes as we think of Jesus as just our friend, buddy, our pal, we don't go back to the Word of God to find out what it says about our buddy, our God, and our pal. It don't go, we don't go back to the Word to find out what it says about my situation. What I do is I find the best way I seem fit to get out of my struggles and trials. Or I find a good reason why I need to do something that I shouldn't do. Or I will find a good reason to do this. Blame God for allowing this to happen. As we're going to tie this all in in a minute, y'all just track with me a little bit. Moses and Elijah were right there with him, the sum of the Old Testament. We've got Moses, the lawgiver, and we've got Elijah, the one that guarded the law. These were two guys in Jewish history that they just held up, they lifted up. When you read down through the Gospels, you're going to hear them refer to the law of Moses. The law of Moses, Moses' writings. You're going to hear them refer to the prophets. You're going to hear them refer to who they are and what they've done. And Elijah's going to rise up and Moses is going to rise up. What did Moses do? Call and response. Call him out of Egypt, didn't he? Let him out of Egypt. See, I'll give you all three seconds. Y'all miss that. What did Elijah do? On the top of Mount Carmel, 450 Baal's, Baal prophets were there, and he prays to God, and God sends fire down. That's a pretty amazing fellow, isn't it? This is Elijah, the one that slapped the water and walked through the Jordan River. This is Elijah, you know, the one that raised the dead. A dead man he brought back to life, a dead boy, and laid down on Moses and Elijah are right there with Jesus, talking with him. I think it was Luke said about his exodus. What do you mean? Jesus going to have an exodus? Jesus leading a good exodus. Jesus leading the exodus out of sin and into righteousness. He's leading a, an exodus out of unrighteousness and into holiness. He's leading an exodus out of a life headed for death to a life headed for everlasting life. That's what Jesus is leading. That's his exodus. He's leading people too, isn't it? Just come to him and follow him and you'll have everlasting life. The whole Old Testament, Moses led them out of Egypt. Elijah right there, testifying to the witness of Scripture. This is God's man. This is him. This is who we're following. And then we have Peter. Man, he looks up and he sees everything going on. Lord, it is good for us to be here with you in verse 4. If you wish, let me make you three tabernacles right here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Let's just, let's build some tents and let's just stay here. Let's just stay right here. Let's don't go anywhere. That's what we like to do sometimes, isn't it? Just stay right there. Stay where we are. Luke says, I think it was in, in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 31, they were speaking of Jesus' departure, and right there it talks about that exodus that we were talking about. If we're not ready to move out from where we are, if we're not ready to follow the exodus of the mass of people, where are we going to be? Are we going to be following God? Or just staying still, staying idle? Are we going to be allowing him to work in our lives? 
or are we just going to stay right where we are in comfort zone take care of us mass exodus Jesus is leading Jesus says if, if uh, when I go to the grave I'm going to come out for all those who follow him our bodies will go into the grave one day we'll be raised to everlasting life that's an exodus we're looking for that's an exodus that we want to see that we want everyone to be a part of and right here as these Old Testament saints are help are right there talking with Jesus uh, nothing's recorded about what they say Moses said it might be a hard rest of the walk because them people some stubborn stiff necked folks Elijah might say, don't worry about it because God will send fire down and just, just consume us all. So I, we don't know what they were talking about. They were just talking about him going to Jerusalem. Maybe they were encouraging him. You know, the Father's plan's always best. The Father's plan always works out. You know, the Father always sends you what you need when you ask for it. Maybe it, Elijah said, you remember when I was on that mountain? I was even looking at Jesus. Wait, you there too? You remember how God sent that fire down, licked up all the water in that trench, burn it up? Maybe Elijah says, you is son. You know he's going to be with you. And Jesus was all about the will of the Father. So they were talking about, they were encouraging him. Because we know time and time again, Jesus needed encouragement too. That's why he stayed in prayer, isn't it? That's why he stayed in that close communion with the Lord. But we see this, another thing I need to realize in my life. Man's plans, they will not mess up God's plans. Man's plans will not mess up God's plans. Look at verse 4. Peter said, Lord, let's just stay here. Let's build tabernacles and let's just live it out right here. The kingdom come right here, right now. Let's just stay up here. And then in verse 5, I think it was, it said this, that while he was still speaking, God comes in. God moves in, and everything gets still quiet, and everybody's scared. So what, what we, man's plans will not mess up God's. If you've got your Bible, turn over a couple, couple of pages, Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse 21. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. And from that time, Jesus began to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. You remember when I, when I mentioned a minute ago, we want to tell Jesus what he's going to do? Or we want to tell God how to act and things he needs? That's what Peter done, isn't it? We just like Peter, ain't we? God, this ain't right. That ain't what we need to do. God forbid it. And then just six days later, Peter's back in it again. He was walking with Jesus. That tells me a little bit something about myself. I might have lasted a day or two. Six days later, you see, Peter's trying to change the plan of Jesus. He's trying to change the plan of the Father. Does that make sense? He said, Jesus, it ain't going to work this way. You're not going down there to die. If Jesus don't go die, we have no Savior. If Jesus is not buried in the grave and raised from dead, we have no chance of everlasting life. Sometimes we, with our plans and our good thoughts and our fine opinions, we want to redirect God's plan. And it's not going to work. This is what's going to happen. We'll be left behind. We'll be left out. And this, and you know, and I believe this is what he's showing Jesus. Because Peter, right before this, right before the time when Jesus said, you know, Peter, we're fixed to go down to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. You know the question that he asked the disciples? Who do you say that I am? Oh, they're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, I'm going to die. No, you're not. God forbid it. And then six days later, Peter says again, no, it's not the plan. And then God says, yes, it is the plan, Peter. Your mind is not set on my things. They're set on your own. 
oftentimes I'm too low low minded but my plans will not mess up the plans of the God in verse 5 and 6 of Matthew chapter 17 God the Father seals it he seals the plan he seals it into this this is what's going to happen this will take place the bright cloud the Shekinah glory again of God comes in and kind of overshadows them and, and God's voice comes out of the cloud and he says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen, listen to him. And then what did it say they did? Disciples hit the dirt, didn't they? They hit the ground. Sometimes when we come to God, we don't come with that kind of reverence and awe of splendor and wonder. They were afraid. Sometimes when I get too buddy-buddy with Jesus, you know, I don't get afraid of him. He's God. He's king, isn't he? We want to get buddy-buddy with God, and Moses thought he was buddy-buddy with God, didn't he? And he hit the rock instead of spoke to it, and then he didn't get, to, he didn't get into the promised land. Isn't that amazing? We, we'll forfeit the blessings... That's, Never mind. Look back at verse 5. While he was still speaking, this cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Verse 6. When the disciples heard this, they fell down on their face to the ground and were terrified. Sometimes in our lives, we don't have that holy fear of God. He does not terrify us when he should terrify us. But he's my friend. Yes, he's king. He is God. He is creator. He is holy. He is righteous. And we stand before him. So we need to do this. If he seals it. Jesus Christ is king and he is. He showed us his glory right here. What it's going to look like when he comes back. I need to respect him. I need to respect him. We see this. I need to do his will and not mine. It's his will be done. Not buddies. And that's some hard. With our culture. With things going on. It's hard to set. It's easy to set aside his word. And do what I want. It's easy to set, easy to set aside his will. And say it's my will. It's easy to set aside his holiness, but God, you know my heart, and I'm going to do my unholiness and that type of stuff. We, can, we need to be careful to respect him in all that we do. We need to do this. <coughs> we are called to be like Christ, and the glory of God should shine through us from the inside out. From the inside out. Good works that are prepared for us in Christ will come and we had better understand and we will better understand who he is. As we begin to do these good works, as we begin to follow God, as we begin to serve God, sometimes we may be like Peter and say, God, this ain't right. We don't want to do this. But pretty soon we're going to come back right in line with what he says and what he does. We're going to come back in line with his will. We're going to do 